Hi, uh, I'm an architect and an urban designer here in, uh, well, in Brooklyn, New York. And the trouble with my profession, urban design, is that half of it you can control, you can absolutely author design, but you can't necessarily author or control urbanity. It happens for a whole host of different reasons. So some of the things that we do is we produce these uh, very large models, all kinds of models, computational models, physical models, and think about cities themselves. We also want people to get active about thinking about cities, people that don't normally think about cities to be involved in the project of the city 2.0. So we, we, when we produce our models, many people come to the table and we work together and dream, I guess, or fantasize about the best possible city. And it only works if you get very detailed about that narrative. So if you have uh, uh, you know, thoughts about something that's really outlandish, jetpacks or, or flying blimps, and this is our work uh, for popular science, uh, so not all of that will necessarily reify or come true unless there's a kind of uh, uh, a love, a general consensus by uh, the community at large that we want something like that. You could never have imagined the cell phone or the smartphone we have today if it wasn't for something like Star Trek. So those important detail narratives, that speculation builds up how we deal with the non-design side to urban design. Uh, one of those details I did at MIT where I worked my doctoral studies with Bill Mitchell, we produced a city car. This was a car that was intended uh, to fit cities, not cities designed around automobiles. So there's a technology that was uh, super small, low footprint, uh, had uh, articulating frames so it stood up. You can park 300 of them on a New York City block. They were uh, omnidirectional, they were drive by wire, it was a kind of a Facebook on wheels, but it was an entire imagination, a scenario, if you will, about how we'd interact with cities. And this would be one of those possible mechanisms. Uh, more on that same kind of thing was, well, what? It's not only cities, it's about population, and people move, and sometimes they move together, and it's very dense. So we thought about moving people in these, what we're calling, hug and kiss lamb cars, super soft, omnidirectional vehicles that are connected to the municipal grid, move in flocks and herds, and it's okay if this vehicle rubs up against another vehicle. In fact, that's kind of the point, is systems that are scuffable, and they move like sheep. And when you enter them into the kind of city, they would move in, in flocks or clusters. And if they find something like a big, nasty metal box like a Hummer, they'd cluster around it and push it off the side of the road as they take over the streets. And it's not just about the vehicles themselves. There's a lot of issues about rare earth metal and electric vehicles, a lot of lithium ion, 3,000 laptop batteries in each particular car. And that's when we realized this is more about energy, not cars, energy in cities that could absorb to, uh, uh, energy on the fly or absorb peak demands and move it around the grid dynamically. So it wasn't about the car as much as it, it led to other systems that came about. And what is the kind of the perfect urban designer? Well, it's certainly not a professional that spent all these years in school. It could be anyone, anyone that has the capacity to think and wishes to get deeply into those narratives, the most visceral level. So we have two big figures that I think make up a great kind of urban designer, which I call an urban ear, really. Uh, Jane Jacobs, the kind of the, the old lady with the pen that was all about community activism and, and, and stop this other man, her kind of foil or enemy, Robert Moses, who is this kind of a big bureaucratic bastard that put all these projects in place in New York City, highway systems, bridges, etc. Real uh, racist kind of jerk, but, but, but was known as the power broker and was able to get things done. And I imagine the two of them as kind of combined, or that they were secretly having sex and the condom broke and they produced a love child named uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who I thought would be the best kind of example of both those wor worlds. Someone that is very top-down and also bottom-up. Someone that invented landscape architecture, that thought about nature in the city. A totally different person making his own discipline in this case. And I thought, and I know it's not historically accurate, but that kind of child of those two worlds is what I find to be a great kind of thinker when it comes to cities. And what do urban ears do? Well, hopefully you try and communicate to other folks what's happening with your city. So Occupy Wall Street, big problem. When that happened, we thought, let's, let's try and communicate what's happening down on Wall Street. So here is Manhattan in relationship to the rest of the United States, commanding 11.5% uh, of the GDP. And then a graph of Manhattan in section showing the population that produces that GDP and where they're located. And essentially, you'll see that giant spike right over there is more or less downtown in the Wall Street area, where each individual is producing, on the average, $1.2 million compared to what everyone else makes along the city. 
And we started to produce this kind of model or folly that shows that, so it's physical, so anyone hopefully can understand the difference in wealth in cities and what they produce. So this giant uh, uh, phallic-like shape there, white penis thing, uh, represents exactly the amount of money that's being produced uh, in Wall Street at that time, to scale. The model was made of 8,500 uh, white people, so we kind of assembled them together, They're actually plastic white people that came from China, and this is a section down below, which shows people just what's happening in New York and getting very physical about it. And then ecograms, explaining to everyone what else is happening in cities or why we have cities in the first place. So this is a kind of a very quick history of cities, but originally the center of cities were created for notions of spirituality or military defense, and zoom a hundred few centuries into the now, we'd have something like the industrial city. And that's a city that celebrates commerce, really. Skyscrapers for corporations, more or less, especially in, in capitalist nations. The topology of the skyscraper became the semiotic pulse for a great corporate success. So what is the city of the future going to be? What is the meme? And the common one, which actually is a very loose and ever-shifting definition, is the smart city. And it has a lot of interpretations, but it's a meme that we seem to get behind and rally behind. We think it has a number of interpretations. Uh, so here is a kind of an example of one of the smart cities, yet again another model produced by a very big group. We think it means the stuff of life. Waste, food, water, energy, mobility, all kind of connecting into a big grid or a series of grids or nets that have these nodal points. And the center of these nodal points is not necessarily cathedrals to spirituality, or, or skyscrapers to commerce, but here it's something like a waste to energy plant, the things that keep the metabolic flow of the city moving. And that's something that the people of this city can be proud of, a waste to energy plant. Here's another kind of view of the city, and radically changing it at a large scale, thinking about those large shifts as it might be, as a, a, a meta-narrative. That is the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge, and looking deeply at the waterfront here, thinking about absorbing all kinds of uh, aqueous life, not just life for humans, but the peri-urban condition becomes radically different when we start allowing fish and other things that we call nature into our city, and changing the landscape to be friendly for pedestrians, etc. This is a kind of a view alongside that, uh, those riparian corridors or, or uh, ecosystems alongside the water that you would see here that would be sometimes for human programmatic, programmatic use, but other times for uh, nature to take over. And so how do you get deeper into some of those thoughts? Well, this is a project that looks at creating those boundaries and doing it with large-scale adaptive reuse or upcycling, uh, in this case, ghost fleets or ships, military vessels that no longer have a function and be used or cut up uh, as kind of gabions or barriers or buffer zones alongside the city edge to provide uh, space or areas for life for other forms besides humans. So here it is, one of these giant hulls of a ship sunk into the edge of a city, becoming a kind of a coffer dam, absorbing the flow of the river sediments, building up over 50 years or so, and creating a new landscape. But in the meantime, it's a shared world between the world of nature and the city itself. And then looking even deeper into this, here's the Brooklyn Navy Yard, looking at the architecture of something like the dry dock. So here is a former military installation, 300 acres of urban space in the heart of New York City, and thinking about those dry docks becoming blurry boundaries as well. Boundaries that are about water, landscape, and architecture, all simultaneous. Thinking about zones for experimenting with phytoremediation or using plants to clean sewage, zones for creating jobs, such as uh, bringing back the shipping industry to this part of Brooklyn, etc. And you could see this large-scale plan needs a lot of input, not necessarily needs to be executed in that way, but becomes a polemical piece, a point of arguing and a principle when one thinks about a master plan for that area. In this case, one that sort of merges physical architectures with the landscape and with the water simultaneously. Other zones here are showing buildings for clean tech manufacturing, etc. And thinking about green space itself as being productive. So when you norm normally say green space or open space, you think of someone playing frisbee or there's a picnic, we think of green space as supplying the vital needs of our cities, making cities negotiate the inputs and outputs that take up all of the resources in our city. So here is a place where you would grow food or produce algae, etc. 
And then thinking of the suburbs, because I just can't always think about the cities. The greenest possible solution for the suburb, and could that ever happen? So here's a project called the Fab Tree Hab. It uses a technology that's 2,500 years old. It's called pleaching, grafting inosculate matter into one contiguous vascular system, using trees to make homes, living trees, not trees you cut down and bring to a space, but actual living trees. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's going to take a lot of time to do that. Well, yeah, that's the point. I think it's okay. If we can wait 12 years to make a bottle of scotch, I think we can wait 12 years to grow a village of homes that fit locally into its ecosystem. Here they are. Here's the model we did for the MoMA. Here's one showing that's growing. People are often worried, well, how are you going to perform maintenance on a home like this? Because today we have carpentry that's based on 90 degree angles, and we think termites eat living trees. Well, that's not true. We need a new connection to nature to understand a healthy ecosystem versus one that's sick. And there's given enough time, you can certainly repair your home if there's any kind of damage. I know Monty Python shows trees just go and they fall over. It does not happen in real life. If a tree gets sick, you have time to work to heal it or grow a new one in its place. And then looking at other metabolic streams, uh, in this case, back to New York City, the amount of waste produced every day. 38,000 tons of trash. I do not know what that means. It's very hard to visualize that and certainly communicate that to the rest of the world that lives in, in New York. So we took this project called One Hour Tower and showed one hour's worth of compacted waste in the city of New York, and more or less larger than the Statue of Liberty. And what can we do with that waste? Well, actually, one thought was, in this case, use the cellulosic matter in, in our landfills and grow it. Grow it into usable structures of some kind. This is mycelium. We have a license with a company called Ecovative, and making these kind of intelligent fitting bricks that could perhaps produce some kind of public space, sculptural folly, or in the future, actual architecture. And you can imagine buildings produced that are grown from a system that you can find in landfills. Combining mycelium, in this case with aluminum, creates a brick that has some tensile structure, strong compression, and you could make a tower. 53 stories of this material every single day in New York City with the amount of waste that's produced. So if one hour you get the Statue of Liberty, 24 hours we get a skyscraper, which is just an insane amount of waste. And if anything, we don't need to make skyscrapers, we just need to rethink our waste streams in general. Another way we kind of approach ecology in cities uh, and waste itself is to get very down to earth and connect one to one with people. So we produce these follies made out of e-waste, it's kind of a Wally-like robot uh, with QR tags that tell you how much e-waste your particular city is producing. This was in Darmstadt. So here, these little robots are deployed throughout all the public squares in the city. And if people are curious, they get to find out how wasteful they are and what are some of the other solutions and the possibilities for this. And here it is in the center square. Uh, this, is, this is not a doctored photograph. This is actually uh, some sanitation workers looking at our project and wondering, you know, as they circle around it, whether it was art or garbage or art or garbage. And uh, they, they decided it was garbage at some point. That's when we came out and said it's not and explained to them about waste in cities and then realized they know, so they're not the ones we're looking for. And taking this same kind of system, bringing it back to New York. So we did this for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, showing 30 second, a 30-second flash of waste in New York, just e-waste in itself, and another display for the new museum outside with storefront for art and architecture. And of course, it had to be an interactive piece, so uh, after we were completely done with it, we allowed the children to recycle our, our project, which was really a lot of fun for them, and kids can be really violent. Uh, and then the last project that I'm gonna show you is, is, is thinking about new tools as an urban designer. So thinking about cities, biology, population, or socio-ecological cities, and the massive population that we expect to be here within the next hundred years, and communicating that to everyone. So here's the graphs that we normally show. This is just for the next 50 years, but between the difference between developing nations and, and the developed world. This is, we're expecting over 11 billion, although this graph showing around nine by 2050, but billions of more people, where are they? They're going to go, and how do we think about them in cities? Here's this population graph spread throughout the globe. This, uh, this one actually I thought was really interesting, that most people today live inside that circle than outside of it. And in the next 100 years, it's probably still going to be true. So we wanted to produce a kind of a predictive model, a model that was biology, that was about population, that would look a 
look at the entire globe as one city and think about our collected population growth. So here's Buckminster Fuller. We use a large map about population growth and change, rate of change over time, zoom in to different sections, and we produce this very large uh, sculptural model that explains uh, kind of population growth. Here it is, this parametric assembly. Different uh, dowels show different scales and size and change or rate in population. This is us uh, assembling parts of that model, uh, working out it's about 17 feet in length. That's my, my beautiful genius wife up in the corner who is uh, very pregnant right now at this time, so we're definitely thinking about population all the time. Uh, this is uh, the kind of the expanded world as a city and all of the expected areas of, uh, of population centers and their rate of growth. This is some of uh, highlights of some of those particular areas and zones that will be decreasing, actually, or the shrinking city areas. This is another view of some of those really intense population centers changing. This is a shrinking city area. So parts of the Midwest in the United States, certainly northern Europe, parts of Russia are all shrinking, and you would see these kind of zones where it's just sucking in as population disappears while others are exploding. And then getting into the biological mechanism. This is where it completely changed. Working with uh, our, our good friend and partner, Dr. Oliver Medvedic, we looked at E. coli and cell population of E. coli as, kind of, as bacteria creating a model for that future city. So we zoom in to the mega scale from the entire world into 25 of the densest cities we have on Earth today and design them with E. coli or bacteria and allow the shift of population to take place inside there and predict at some level growth, predict explosion, look at, at some level the speculation of that growth. I, I know it's making an analogy of bacteria to you know, people, but there is a kind of an effect where we want the world to be almost seamless between biology and, and people uh, as one kind of contiguous system. Here it is, it's genetically modified E. coli, so it actually bioluminesces. Uh, there's great stuff under long wave uh, LED light, which is embedded inside the other side of our model. These are the 25 cities we are growing and experimenting. Instead of using algorithms and computational tools, which we did for the other side, we wanted to really push what we can do with cell biology. and Think about how E. coli, as a technology, can tell us about how cities will grow, how population will change, because it too is alive. It too has all kinds of behaviors that make sense. It's one of the templates. And this final slide shows this is Istanbul changing from red to green, changing over 100 years its population density in a specific area. This to us is a new way to think about urban design. We explore all kinds of ways to communicate how cities are growing, how they're changing, and how they'll affect us. So anyway, that's my work, but thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>